Good evening, everybody. Let's, let's start this with one of my favorite experiments of all time. I want you to watch this video and calculate how many times a basketball gets passed around. Okay, so regardless of what the answer is, which is 16, by the way, did any of you notice anything strange? Let me replay the video just real quick for those of you who didn't. Do you notice the gorilla walking in the middle of the screen? Funny enough, even people that have seen the video before do not notice that the curtains change color, and multiple people from both teams actually leave the video midway through. This is a great example of motivated perception. This shows us that precisely when we're most focused, our perception narrows down. And the only way we can access our full understanding of the world is by aggregating multiple independent perspectives. I want, what I want to talk to you today is the solution to this problem, which is collective intelligence, an emergent phenomenon where groups of people process information and achieve insights that are not understandable by just individual members alone. Probably many of you have heard of those experiments where they ask a classroom full of students to guess the number of jelly beans in a jar. And somehow, if you take the average of all the guesses, you get to within a few percentage points of the real answer. Scientists for a long time thought that this was just a basic statistical feature of just having a large sample of people guessing. But the truth turns out to be more complicated. And it comes down to collective intelligence. But the best example of collective intelligence is prediction markets where people forecast the future by betting on whether events will happen or will not happen. For example, if I wanted to figure out if Andrew Yang is going to become president of the United States, I would create stock, Andrew Yang stock, that will automatically reach the value of $0 if he loses and $1 if he wins. And as people start betting and the price converges around 40 cents, then the consensus probability of the prediction market would be that Andrew Yang has a 40% chance. It turns out that the predictions created by prediction markets are more accurate than experts themselves, whether it's in the case of sports, whether it's in the case of predicting the Oscars, or even entire elections, even though the people themselves participating in the market are amateurs. The reason as to why this happens is because of collective intelligence. Collective intelligence operates under four principles. First, decentralization. You do not want all the information to actually originate from the same place. You want the process to be distributed, much like a market. The second example is independence, because peer pressure is so powerful that in a room full of people proclaiming that 2 plus 2 equals 5, most of us would give in to peer pressure and agree. That's precisely why privacy is so important, because the ability to dissent from the crowd is the foundation for original thought. The third principle is aggregation. You can have all the information in the world that you want, but if we keep being divided and not united, and where instead of being different and unified, we will not be able to achieve the insights collectively through the information that we aggregate individually. But the most important principle behind collective intelligence is diversity. Diversity not from a social justice perspective, diversity from a cognitive perspective. Let me give you an example. Let's pretend that we can represent people's personality and point of view as a subsection of the alphabet. Alice, Bob, Carl, and Dimitri can only access the entire alphabet when they actually get together. However, if it was up to Alice or Dimitri, they wouldn't talk to each other because they have nothing in common. So it's up to Bob and Charles to actually leverage what they have in common to bridge the gap between the two extremes. That's how collective intelligence happens. Collective intelligence already influences our lives in myriads of ways. For example, in the case of economics, when collective intelligence is low in an economy, bubbles begin to form. Whether it's Dutch tulips or Bitcoin, whenever the consensus over anything becomes one-sided, the price of an asset inflates and eventually crashes all of a sudden. Whereas when collective intelligence is present in an economy, stock, market be stock markets become very efficient. Specifically, over 95% of all hedge fund managers are not able to beat the stock market every year. 
Because stock markets are so effective at aggregating and incorporating information in a way that prevents other people from seeing something that no one else sees on a, over a consistent basis. In the case of science, for example, when collective intelligence is low, you also have stagnation. Specifically, in the context of particle physics, over the last 50 years, particle physicists have not been able to come up with a single particle outside of the Higgs boson, which was predicted all the way into 1960, that could be verified by a particle collider. Why? We have four times as many physicists as we did back then, publishing more than ever. It's because most of them are clustering around string theory, which is not verifiable through the traditional scientific method. So they're in a string theory bubble of sorts. But on the other hand, when collective intelligence is high in science, we have interdisciplinary breakthroughs, such as when DeepMind, the company that built, that built the AI that beat the world champion at Go, last year got a, gr got a group of team members to come up the, with the single best system to predict protein folding, which is a problem that sits at the foundation of developing drugs and cures for disease. They beat out the, over a decade worth of efforts from scientists all over the planet. A team of seven people, machine learning engineers, mathematicians, and biochemists, beat scientists from all over the world. Why? Because collective intelligence was high. In the context of politics, when collective intelligence is low, the voters are trapped into echo chambers. As the society for, further polarizes, and people are not able to develop a consensus and fix real problems. But when collective intelligence is high, the political system becomes an idea meritocracy. Where, what, where, the, where the priorities of the ideas and the things that we need to do in the public sphere get there through their own merit as opposed to who shouts the loudest. Therefore, collective in intelligence influences our society in almost every way. It's, it's the foundation for pro product productivity and progress. But how does collective intelligence affect us individually? Well, it affects us in several different scales. At the individual level, Collective intelligence means that we need to be interacting with perspectives that are different from our own. Cognitive scientists have identified a technique called dialectical bootstrapping, where it's been shown that when people are asked to simulate what their top five friends and how they would answer their, the question, they somehow get to a better answer than if they answer the question directly. That's because it forces people to interact with different perspectives from their own, and they end up being less biased when they make the decision. At the organizational level, what this means is that diversity should be pursued middle out. Part of the issue with diversity is that it's very difficult to aggregate extreme viewpoints all in the same place. For example, in the most racially integrated police departments all over the country, they have the highest rates of either people being fired or leaving the force. Because diversity, if not managed properly, breeds conflict. So it's up to Bob and Carl to come together and slowly expand by incorporating people who are different from them to eventually create a more collectively intelligent and diverse community. The best example uh, in this case is Elvest, a multi-billion dollar financial technology firm. And the CEO implemented a very simple rule. All employees need to be hiring somebody that's very different from them. In the process, she ended up building an organization that's over 60% female and where over 20% of the employees are either African-American or Latinx, numbers that were thought to be impossible in Silicon Valley. Not by targeting a specific demographic, but specifically by pushing everybody to interact with people who are very different from them. But then we get to the societal level, in a collective intelligence can ground a different way of thinking about the issues. One major issue when we think about diversity at a societal level is that we tend to use quotas that reduce diversity to a single dimension. A good example for, of, for this is how the neuroendocrinology field in the 90s had a huge push to include more women, which made sense. If more women studied hormones, we would better understand how hormones affect things like pregnancy. However, in the process of pushing for this kind of recruitment, racial diversity in the field went down. The unintended consequence of reducing diversity to a single variable and over-optimizing for it is that we fail at achieving the central objective which is promoting collective intelligence. Therefore, a truly collective intelligent society does not think about diversity in terms of quotas. Instead, it focuses on inclusion and neurodiversity. First, of people on the autism spectrum. This is Michael Burry, one of the most successful investors of all time. He made over a billion dollars in the middle of the financial crisis by successfully betting against the housing market when every single person thought that he was crazy. 
He's also on the autism spectrum. And we're only now beginning to understand that people on the autism spectrum have a mirror neuron system that's very different from that of neurotypical people. And often, it's framed as a bug because it makes it more challenging for people to be able to learn social behavior through imitation. Instead, it's a feature because it enables people to engage in a contrarian perspective when they think they're right and nobody else does because they're less susceptible to peer pressure. The second main demographic is transgender people. This is Martine Rothblatt. She's the founder of Sirius XM. She has revolutionized the world when it comes to space technology and when it comes to satellites. And she did all of this way before Elon Musk. Not only that, she also started United Therapeutics, a biotech company that has already cured a bunch of rare diseases that were thought to be uncurable, which has made her the highest paid female CEO in the world. She's also, by the way, the first openly transgender CEO in the world. A few studies came out last year actually showing how transgender people are less susceptible to optical illusions, showing us that we've barely scratched the surface to truly understand the kind of value transgender people can bring into our society. And the problem when it comes to neurodiversity is that we often think of people on the autism spectrum and transgender people as disabled people who need our help to avoid the worst possible scenario, as opposed to individuals whose potential remains untapped because we're not empowering them to contribute to the collective intelligence of our society. And that needs to change. But I would be remiss if I limited collective intelligence to just human intelligence. Artificial intelligence plays a massive role in collective intelligence. You've probably have all seen all the studies where an artificial intelligence beats a doctor at diagnosing disease. Rarely is the question asked, what happens if the doctor and the AI work together? The few studies that exist on the subject all point to the same conclusion. Performance goes up because the, the way the AI approaches the problem and the way the doctor approaches the problem are different in complementary ways. That's why when they work together, collective intelligence emerges. That's why when it comes to collective intelligence, the most valuable type of diversity is not of race, it's of experience. It's not of gender, it's of personality. And it's not of class, but of ideas. Because the type of diversity that enhances collective intelligence is not social, it's cognitive. That's why the only way we can bring about a society of free and prosperous individuals is if we have a vision for the future that's grounded in collective intelligence, which means that we need to be just as committed to including neurodiverse people as we are to the development of artificial intelligence so that eventually, and over time, but most importantly, together, we can see the full landscape of human possibility. Thank you.